Good afternoon and greetings from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. My name is Jake Pratt and I'm the director of the Office of PhD Studies here at Southeastern. We're so glad you could join us for the Southeastern Symposium. It's a pleasure for our students, faculty, and alumni to have an opportunity to give back to the communities and churches that have supported them by sharing the fruits of their biblical research and writing. We hope that you walk away from this event with knowledge that helps you to grow in your love for God and ability to serve others. A word of thanks is in order for a number of individuals without whom we could not have pulled this event off in such a short time. First, several publishers such as Langham, Lexham, Baker, IVP, and B&H have graciously donated books and or agreed to sponsor plenary sessions. With those monetary proceeds, we are able to provide emergency financial assistance to students who've been impacted by crises such as COVID-19. If you would also like to donate, please see the Give Now link located on the main page of the Southeastern Symposium. Second, a number of SEBIT staff have worked tirelessly over the last few weeks to pull this event together. I would like to thank Sam Morris, the Director of Admissions, and Griffin Gulledge, Director of Communications, for leveraging all of their marketing influence to promote this event. If you heard about this event on social media, they are likely responsible. On logistics, we could not have pulled this digital event together without Bernard Chung, who's working behind the scenes to minimize any technical glitches. In addition, my own staff, Christy Thornton and Jordan Paris, are the real masterminds behind this event. Finally, I'd like to thank our plenary speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules to participate in this event. Each participant was strategically chosen to represent the three broad areas of study that characterize our PhD program. In addition, the work that each of these scholars is doing in their respective field captures the heart of the mission and vision of the PhD at Southeastern, which seeks to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by equipping scholars for the vocation of teaching and engaging in academic research that furthers theological understanding in order to serve the church and fulfill the Great Commission. In short, they are all Great Commission scholars. For Applied Theology, tomorrow you will hear from a 2017 alumnus, Dr. Matthew Bennett, who is Associate Professor of Missions and Theology at Cedarville University. For Theological Studies, you will hear from Dr. Matthew Emerson, a 2011 alumnus who currently serves as an Associate Professor of Religion at Oklahoma Baptist University, and recently took over as the Dean of the Hobbes College of Theology and Ministry. Congrats, Dr. Emerson. Finally, for Biblical Studies, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Maburu, our first plenary speaker and a 2008 Sebbets PhD alumnus. Elizabeth Maburu is the Regional Coordinator of Langham Literature in Africa. She's an Associate Professor of New Testament and Greek and teaches part-time at Pan-Africa Christian University. She is the current Vice Chair of the Africa Society for Evangelical Theology and is on the editorial team. She is also the co-convener of the Africa Baptist Theological Educators Network. She's a curriculum evaluator for the Association of Christian Theological Education in Africa. She serves as the coordinator of the Africa Baptist Commentary Revision Project and the New Testament Theological Editor. Her research and publishing interests are primarily in the areas of New Testament, Bible translation, intercultural hermeneutics, and culture and worldview studies. She's from Kenya and is married with three children. Just so you're aware, Dr. Maburu is coming to us from Kenya, so it is possible that her video quality may be lower than our other plenary speakers. Still, I have no doubt that you will receive great benefit from her presentation. As you listen and engage with her lecture, consider whether God might be calling you to a teaching ministry in a college or university or a majority world academic or ecclesial context. Sebbets offers a terminal degree in biblical studies in both residential and modified residency format. So now, students have an option to pursue a PhD in biblical studies while staying in their ministry context, wherever that may be, whether across the state or around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elizabeth Maburu. Good morning. Uh, it's really good to be here with you uh, today, virtually. I hope that you are all keeping safe and doing well. Uh, my paper topic today is African Hermeneutics. It's based off of this book, African Hermeneutics, which was published last year by Hippo Books. Interpreting the Bible is always a challenging task. To be more precise, interpreting the Bible accurately is a challenging task. And yet, the Bible is meant to be understood and applied 
in the daily lives of believers it is to be a guide for faith and practice. The problem that led me to consider this book was that of dichotomy amongst believers in Africa. I asked myself several questions. Why is it that after more than 100 years of exposure to Christianity, traditional practices such as witchcraft, ancestor worship, and polygamy are still found in Africa? Why is it not uncommon to hear of pastors consulting witch doctors to acquire more power for the pulpit? Why is it that we hear of Christians using witchcraft to grow their businesses? And why, if the statistics on corruption and unethical practices on our continent and are to be believed, why has there been so very little transformation of society? My conclusion was that while the content of Christianity may be known and perhaps even understood, practice is often not consistent with this knowledge. The result is that individual believers and churches are weak and Christianity has lost a great deal of credibility. This book is an attempt to address this problem. African readers of the Bible face the challenge that most of the models and methods of Bible interpretation or hermeneutics are rooted in a Western context. This is not surprising, given that Christianity came to Africa from the West, churches and theological institutions that were founded were missionary-led, and most of the theological resources we have are produced by Western writers. It seems that we as Africans are still trying to imitate foreign ways when it comes to reading, interpreting, the, and, and applying the Bible in our everyday lives. Perhaps if we understood that the interpretation of the Bible was already being done by Africans almost 2,000 years ago, we might change our perspective. So the solution I propose is a contextualized African intercultural approach to the study of the Bible. You know, people sometimes speak of hermeneutics as if it has principles that are set in stone. But is hermeneutics static or is it dynamic in the sense that it can change as methods of interpretation are adapted to different cultural contexts? To answer that question, we need to look more closely at what hermeneutics does. First of all, hermeneutics is necessary because we cannot hope to experience genuine transformation, whether of self or others, if we lack the knowledge and skills to effectively interpret the Bible. Such interpretation will always involve both theory and practice, for the methods we use must have a theoretical foundation as well as a practical application. This statement implies that hermeneutics must be linked to a particular place. If our hermeneutical models are all from the West, how can we derive practical applications in an African context? Moreover, if we fail to interrogate our African culture and worldview and how it relates to a biblical one, how can we understand what the Bible has to say about daily life in Africa? The contextual approach that I will describe is one way of addressing this issue. This approach to unlocking the African understanding of biblical texts is not new. It's doing what Jesus did, for he too used elements of his culture to teach, moving from the known to the unknown, particularly in his parables. This is an, effectively, uh, an extremely effective instructional technique and is especially significant for African readers since the culture of the Bible resembles the African culture in so many ways. Thus, the hermeneutical gaps for African interpreters may be significantly less than those faced by Western interpreters whose cultures are far removed from that of the Bible. I must caution that Contextualization carries a very real danger of sliding into syncretism. Syncretism occurs when religious and cultural forms are combined with a biblical message without any regard for whether they align with biblical truth. This is one of the major challenges the church in Africa is currently facing. So this method ensures that we don't fall into this trap. Whatever one's hermeneutic communicates as far as relevance to different cultures and subcultures within Africa is concerned, it must be in alignment with the Bible's teachings. Paul's speech in Athens is the blueprint for my model. Although we don't have time to examine it closely, that is Acts 17, this speech demonstrates Paul's great skill in building bridges of communication across cultures and worldviews through contextualization. Paul does two significant things. One, he interrogates and confronts the worldviews of the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers by using several points of contact 
as effective bridges. In this speech, Paul addresses several common elements of their worldview. But as we read his words, we note that although he understands the worldview of his opponents and even sometimes uses it to his advantage, he never compromises his own Christ-centered worldview. He uses their cultural resources, and that's the second thing that he does, to lead them into an understanding of biblical truth by quoting two poems from their own poets. Yet, he can still engage positively with the beliefs of his hearers. One assumption we have to make as we approach any passage in the Bible is that it is understandable and that its message can be proclaimed in a way that links to our culture and worldview, as Paul demonstrates. This is the philosophy behind the four-legged stool model proposed in this book. It's an intercultural model that encourages a dialogue between the African context and the biblical context. It's therefore based on the concept of moving from the known to the unknown. It's also based on recognizing the value of our cultural resources, our poems, our stories, our songs, our proverbs, and so forth, as bridges to promote understanding, internalization, and application of the biblical text. When we do this, we are more likely to overcome the dichotomy I referred to. The ultimate goal of this method is that we acquire a biblical worldview that guides us in our day-to-day -day living. That is, African believers need to ground their entire orientation to life in a cohesive biblical base, based on biblical assumptions. In addition, it must be consistent, that is our biblical worldview, with the entire story of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the biblical meta-narrative. That is why worldview forms the foundation for my model and why the various steps of the model strive to enhance the development of a biblical worldview. Let's look at worldview and biblical interpretation for a minute. Since Bible interpretation can never be done in a vacuum, this contextualized hermeneutic begins with an exploration of African worldviews. Our cultures and worldviews are founded on certain assumptions. Because of this, we approach the Bible from different perspectives. When I was 10 years old, I had to memorize a poem called The Blind Man and the Elephant by Godfrey Sachs. I remember being baffled by the idea of six blind men trying to see an elephant. I was even more perturbed as the poem unfolded, trying to identify with the experience of each of these men as they touched different parts of the beast and came to their own conclusions about its form. I thought them somewhat silly since I, Having grown up in an environment where they were quite common, knew exactly what an elephant looked like. As the poem came to an end, I was forced to conclude with the poet that although all of them were partly right, they were all wrong. So powerfully did this poem impact me that I remember feeling saddened by it. While I had the whole picture, they did not, and I had no way of sharing it with them. Just as the blind men were confused, by their different perceptions of the elephant, so we in Africa end up being confused when we are fed a diet of Western perspectives on the biblical text. This confusion is compounded when we have been fed this perspective for so long that we no longer recognize that it is out of touch with the way we live. Again, the result is the dichotomized life I mentioned earlier. What happens then is that the African worldview steps in to fill this gap, and this affects our interpretation, sometimes positively, but more often than not, negatively, because we have not yet learned how to interrogate our worldviews as we engage with the text. Let's look at just one example. Ultimate reality. This is the most important element in any worldview. What functions as God in the lives of individuals and communities? Is it a spirit that prefers to remain aloof? Is it the ancestors, perhaps? Or maybe even science and matter? Could it be an impersonal spiritual force? Or even a personal being who reveals himself to us? Our understanding of ultimate reality forms the foundation for our lives and defines the path that our worldview takes. Every culture in the world has some concept of an ultimate reality. However, each culture understands it differently. In the traditional African context, 
Ultimate reality is defined as the supreme being. As is characteristic of African thinking, this concept of God is holistic. In other words, it does not exist in isolation from other beliefs. All are part of the same spiritual fabric. There's no need to prove God's existence. Uh, this supreme being is assumed to be present everywhere in the sense that people can call on him for help wherever they are. This is, of course, a generalization. While certain understanding is held in common, details about the nature of the supreme being differ from place to place and from culture to culture within Africa. Because of this, it's sometimes difficult for Africans to grasp the idea of one universal God that we can all hold in common. So, because of time, I'll focus on only one example of how to interrogate an aspect of ultimate reality and then use the biblical worldview to serve as a point of reference. This is the idea of transaction. Traditional Africans, uh, traditional African interactions with the Supreme Being are transactional as opposed to relational. There was a belief amongst traditional Africans that if one lived wisely in the present, uh, one would reap positive benefits in the future. As German puts it, the worship of God was utilitarian, seeking God for the help they might receive rather than extolling the greatness and goodness of God. Traditional African worship therefore focused not on God, but on human needs and desires. This is one reason why the prosperity gospel and neo-Pentecostalism has taken root in Africa. It presents a familiar way of viewing life. Now, on the other hand, unwise living resulted in certain punishment. It is understood that a retribution, a retribution theology undergirds God's dealings with mankind. So how does this African worldview compare with the biblical one? Uh, the crucial difference is that the biblical worldview affirms that God, not human beings, is the center of his universe. He demands worship from us. The biblical worldview encourages a personal, relational interaction with God, albeit through the mediation first of priests in the Old Testament, as we look through it, and then of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So God is a relational God, not a transactional God. Moreover, suffering is not always God's punishment for sin. We can say more, but I think that's enough for now. So what's the situation in modern Africa? With the coming of Christianity, much confusion arose as to how we were to re relate to the Christian God. There were several barriers, a foreign language that needed to be translated, the race of Jesus Christ, which brought confusion because it appeared to match the race of the colonizers, and the foreign and confusing worldview of the missionaries that left us with two gods, Jesus Christ and God. Despite these barriers, Christianity has taken root in Africa. But traces of the traditional African worldview can still be seen. While many of us have a firm belief in God, our interactions with him may shift between transactional and relational. And in most cases, the transactional element is what is more prominent. As modern African Christians, we frequently find ourselves doing good things so that God will reward us. The growing tentacles of prosperity theology have fueled this perspective so that prayers frequently consist of asking God for yet more blessings, which of course translates to material things. When we are aware that we have sinned, and now this is the retribution theology coming in, we respond in a vastly different way. We wait apprehensively for punishment. Indeed, almost all suffering is viewed as a punishment from God. This was most recently demonstrated in Kenya after the coronavirus pandemic reached our borders. The first response by the government and church leaders was to hold a day of prayer to repent and to ask God for his forgiveness for offenses committed against him. What are the implications of this kind of understanding, this kind of worldview for hermeneutics? Let's look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Africans assume the existence of a supreme being. And so on one level, we would read this text as saying that God exists and has existed from eternity past. This is a crucial point, particularly in this age of growing secularism, where the existence of God is questioned at every turn. On a second level, we would focus on the creativity of this eternal God. He alone is the creator of all things. The rest of Genesis 1 would confirm this initial interpretation. This is an important point of contact with African thinking. For many African myths deal with the creation of the world 
and humankind by a supreme being. While the identity of the God named in the text would have to be clearly defined to avoid syncretism, our African worldview here works in a positive way to encourage an accurate understanding of this biblical text. On the other hand, our African worldview can also have a negative influence on our interpretation of a text. We can illustrate this from Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. The traditional transactional understanding of our relationship with the Supreme Being has led many to interpret this verse as meaning when you give monetary gifts, particularly in the form of tithes, offerings, and gifts to the poor, God is obligated to bless you in return. We don't look for spiritual blessings, rather we look for financial rewards. The link to the prosperity gospel is clear. What we may fail to note is that interpreting the text this way leads us to give with the wrong motives, not because we love God and want to thank him for his faithfulness and his grace, but because we want something back. Our giving becomes merely a transaction. So, so far, I've briefly ex explained how one fundamental element of our worldview affects our understanding of the biblical text, and, I, and I've shown you that this can be both positive or negative. So this leads us to the next step, the model described in this book. And as I explain the model, uh, we'll also talk about how African cultural resources are incorporated. Remember the model of Paul. The rest of the book will describe how this model works in four main genres of the Bible, story, a song or poetry, wisdom and letter, but because of time, I won't go into detail. So my model is the four-legged stool model. Uh, it's described using the metaphor of a four-legged stool uh, because a stool is a familiar object in Africa, both in the past and in the present. Just as a good stool is stable and supports our weight, so the hermeneutical stool will be one we can put our weight on, confident that it provides a stable or accurate interpretation of the biblical text. So to do so, uh, it requires examining four legs, which in this case are one, parallels to the African context, two, the theological context, three, the literary context, and four, the historical context. These four legs support the seat, which represents the final stage of interpretation the application. One thing to note, the legs are not independent of each other and we'll find that we'll be moving back and forth between them as we try to find the right balance. This is because as we gain more information, our assumptions about the text change and our understanding grows. So the first leg parallels the African context is the place where we begin our search for understanding. This involves identifying the theological and cultural contexts that are the primary contributors to our own worldviews, as well as any relevant features of our social, political, and geographical contexts. There are two main reasons why this first leg is so important. Number one, it enables us to begin to understand the biblical text from a familiar position. This is important because this hermeneutical model involves moving from the known to the unknown. And two, Examining our own worldview and context puts us in a position to recognize where our assumptions do not fit with the text. It's only recently that scholars have come to recognize the two-sided nature of historical conditioning. What does this mean? It means that while the Bible stands in a historical context and tradition, so does the reader. The Bible's context and the reader's context are in constant engagement with one another as I have just demonstrated in my example of ultimate reality. Ukochuku speaks of this in terms of shared mutual interests or commonalities between the narrator and the listener. These are a crucial interpretive key for the listener. Why? This is because they define the scope within which meaning can begin to be determined. A narrator cannot begin to tell a story that has absolutely no connection with his audience. The mutual interests guide the listener as to how to hear and interpret the story. So these mutual interests also form the basis on which the narrator earns the right to be heard by his audience. So how does this apply to our biblical texts? 
Without these mutual interests, the reader is left grappling in the dark, not fully understanding either the meaning or the application of the text. So the first leg of my hermeneutical stool therefore guides us in identifying these points of contact with the biblical text. Consider the story of the woman caught in adultery in John 7. How does this story relate to our African context? We can identify two main links. The first is the matter of adultery. Even though polygamy was a feature of traditional life, it was generally understood that sex outside a marital relationship was taboo. Indeed, adultery was a punishable offense that incurred severe fines and sometimes even physical punishment, such as caning. Consequently, we can easily relate to a story that involves adultery. Two, we can recognize the elements of the honor-shame value system that are present in this story. In an honor-shame system, adultery is regarded as not only morally wrong, but it also brings shame on the persons involved and their community. So we can understand something about what is going on when a woman who has been caught in adultery is exposed to public shame. We have mutual interests with the narrator of the biblical text. So in this example, similarities between African and biblical cultures and worldview make it easier for us to begin to understand the text. We may not always be in a position to fully analyze our context and worldview at this stage. What is important is to acknowledge that they exist and to begin to interrogate them as we read the biblical text so that it begins to feel more familiar. Then we can turn to legs two, three, and four of the stool to investigate the specific context of the Bible. So to sum up, the first leg of the hermeneutical stool is to consciously identify our own context and find points of contact between it and the biblical context. In this way, we can identify cues that will allow for a more accurate interpretation of the text through a process of comparing the two contexts and analyzing the findings as we interrogate our negative and positive um, aspects of our worldview. The second leg is a theological context. This seeks to understand the theological emphasis of a text and now these are expressed in relation to the section and book in which uh, they are found. Uh, many scholars have pointed out that the Bible can be viewed as literature. However, even though it's a literary work, it's primarily a spiritual document. The aim of the Bible is to bring unbelievers to faith and to build faith in, um, in believers so that they may live their lives in a godly manner. This is a spiritual concern. Therefore, one key to the process of interpretation is a correct understanding of the theological emphasis of a text. So I move straight to theological concerns rather than to the historical and cultural contexts. The answer is that the spiritual dimension of life is always a factor in our interaction with the world around us as Africans. Because of this orientation, when we read the Bible, we tend to look for issues that relate to God and faith and how these affect our everyday lives. So this is therefore the logical next step in the way we process information. At this level, therefore, some tentative points of application will already begin to present themselves. When we read Mark's Gospel, we soon become aware of the major theological emph emphasis that Jesus is the miracle-working, authoritative Son of God. There are strategic references to his being the Son of God in various places, and many scholars have noted that the Gospel of Mark begins with this theme and ends with it. Obviously, this is no coincidence, since Mark's audience was a church in Rome. We know that around that time, the Roman emperors were beginning to insist that they be referred to as gods. So what does Mark do with this theme? He turns his reader's attention away from these false gods to the true Son of God. So it's this theological understanding that should guide our interpretation. But if someone makes the mistake of assuming that the major theological emphasis of Mark is that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, promised in the Old Testament, the result will be that some conclusions arrive that will be wrong. How so? The way the story unfolds doesn't place great emphasis on how a Roman reader would understand this term, Messiah. Instead, focusing on this aspect will be counterproductive since a Roman reader uh, would, since the Roman context was very different from the Jewish context. 
So for instance, a text on healing like Mark 7, 31 to 37 would not have the right impact if the author was emphasizing that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. But when we look at the Roman context, we notice that it was generally believed that some Roman emperors were divine and could heal. So the right understanding of the theological theme allows us to understand this story in the way the author intended. It's not meant to affirm the messiahship of Jesus, but to challenge the Roman belief in the divinity of emperors. Gerald West notes that in Africa, biblical hermeneutics cannot be separated from theological reflection, as the emphasis is generally on addressing contextual realities within African culture. I already pointed that out. But this emphasis has led to what is known as the fusion of the two horizons in hermeneutics. Interpretation and application are conflated. This approach is harmful to interpretation because we are ignoring the context of the Bible and prioritizing our own context. So what this model does is address that kind of conflation. So to sum up, the second leg of the hermeneutical stool involves ensuring that the theological context is identified before moving on to other aspects of interpretation. It is crucial that the theological emphasis provide the guidelines within which meaning should be sought. However, the other legs of the hermeneutical stool must still be allowed to affect the conclusions arrived at here. Remember, I said that they continue to affect one another. The third leg is the literary context. This is the leg where we identify the literary features of the passage we are interpreting. This is because, as I've already said, the Bible is also a work of literature. So here is where the African cultural resources really come into play. Although I'll only describe the general features that need to be identified, the sections of the book that deal with genre incorporate additional African oral literature interpretive techniques in analyzing the biblical text. This is possible because there is an overlap of genre. So the initial interpretation and tentative application we reached as we worked on legs one and two will be modified and clarified as we engage with this third leg of this tool. So the first thing we look for in this leg is the literary genre. It's, of course, it's important to identify the genre of what we are reading so that we can have some idea of how we should approach the text so that we understand what the author is communicating. Literary genre therefore functions as a vital interpretive key in the hermeneutical process. Perhaps one of the best metaphors used for understanding the role of genre in interpretation is that proposed by Hirsch. He, he suggests that genre should be understood as a game. There are rules that determine how games are played. In the same way, there are rules that an author follows in writing. The reader is aware of these rules and expects that the author has followed them. There's one thing, though, that we need to note. While texts written in the same genre have certain characteristics in common, it is also true that genres are not static or even universal since they change over time. So, while we may find it helpful to consider traditional African oral literature categories as we begin identifying the different genres used in the Bible, we also need to consider what other writers were doing at that time and how they understood what they were doing. And the second aspect we'll look at in this leg is the literary techniques that have been used in the text. These vary depending on whether the material is to be presented orally or in writing. Uh, several features of African oral literature are very important for us here. For much of the scripture that we read began life as oral literature or as a text that was meant to be read aloud in public settings rather than by a solitary reader. That's why orality uh, is very important when we are thinking about Bible interpretation. When something is for oral presentation, the narrator can use a variety of techniques, including mime, songs, dramatic storytelling. Performance is very crucial to the engagement between the teller and the hearer. So reading scripture out loud uh, can help us detect these techniques. Other key features of oral literature that we can apply when we're looking at the Bible include holistic listening, uh, include interaction between the performer, and also include, um, uh, so sorry, just holistic listening and interaction between the performer 
and the audience. So we engage as we are reading. We become involved in the reading. Style too is extremely important where oral stories or narratives are concerned. Uh, features such as plot, setting, characterization, these play a major role in communicating meaning, particularly in narratives. Uh, there's also constant repetition of words and key themes, interaction between narration and dialogue that helps us identify with first one character and then the other so that we truly become a part of the story without changing the story. We also need to pay attention to imagery and symbolism and vividness. In African literature, this vividness is enhanced by constant references to nature. This is very important to understand these details so that we understand the meaning of the communication itself. There's a very significant point at which African literary techniques overlap with techniques found in the Bible. And this is that African stories tend to have a non-linear approach. So they do not clearly identify the moral of the story at the end as some Western stories do. Rather, the whole story carries the message and every component has a role to play. So this approach enables one to arrive at the meaning of the story from many different angles. Crucial interpretive keys are embedded in the very fabric of the story. And you'll find that in some of the biblical stories as well. Language is something that we need to pay attention to. Grammar, syntax, detailed word studies. If we ignore this, uh, we may fail to grasp the full meaning of the text. So we need to know either the original languages in which the Bible was written or have access to tools to help us interpret what we read. Literary flow is very important as well uh, to examine in this leg. African stories, storytellers are extremely skilled in ensuring that there is no breakdown in the flow of information in a story. So there's a cyclical linear development that allows the story to flow smoothly from beginning to end. The details that are necessary for understanding are provided when they are needed to enable the audience to interpret the story. Similarly, a basic principle of biblical hermeneutics is that the intended meaning of any passage is the meaning that is consistent with the sense of the literary context in which it occurs. So the literary context establishes the flow of thought and helps us to determine accurate, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, accurate meaning of the text. Excuse me. So to sum up, the third leg of the hermeneutical stool ensures that the literary context is identified and analyzed. And in uncovering the, many, the meaning of any text, it's crucial that the genre, the literary techniques, the language, and the flow of, of the text guide the process. And then we begin to confirm the meaning of the text arrived at so far. The fourth leg is the historical and cultural context. We know that no text arises out of a vacuum. This is just as true of biblical texts as it is of African texts. All texts arise from a historical and cultural context that needs to be understood if the text is to be interpreted accurately. So geography, politics, economics and history, wars, cultural practices, religious customs, all of these are useful here. So as we grow in understanding of this context, again, we continue to refine the application points we had identified before. In presenting leg one of the hermeneutical stool, we talked about shared mutual interests. Historical and cultural context fall in this category, as it's assumed that the teller and hearer live in the same context. So they grasp historical and cultural issues almost instinctively. They also have the same understanding of the way language is used because of the socially conditioned nature of language. So we must make an effort to step into the world of the narrator or of the author if we hope to understand his communication adequately. This is a bit difficult when it comes to the biblical text because of the temporal and the cultural barriers. Our aim in interpretation is to understand the message intended by the author. So this context must be uncovered and explained in terms that we understand. So in that case, we need to grasp the perspective and the mindset of the author as well, which are really made explicit in the writing. When we don't take the perspective of the author into account, we will miss the drama of a scene and the point the author intended to make. So for instance, the foot washing scene in John 13, if we know that foot washing was customarily the task of non-Jewish slaves, 
and the people who are socially inferior are the ones who wash the feet of their superiors, never the other way around. If we know that, and if we understand that this task was considered too degrading for Jesus' disciples or even Jewish slaves, then if, if we don't understand that, we miss the significance of Jesus' action. Uh, mindset, again, is something we need to understand. If you read the retelling of the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, uh, you will understand uh, why mindset is so important. You need to know something about the period in order to fully understand the purpose and the intended emotional impact of a story. So the fourth leg of the hermeneutical stool involves recognizing that the Bible cannot be understood in isolation from its historical and cultural context. So a crucial aim of our study of the Bible is to understand what the text meant in its original context. So we must enter into the world of the author and allow that world to guide our understanding. The fourth, seat, the fourth, uh, uh, the fifth aspect is the application, the seat. So these legs uh, don't exist in isolation from one another. That have, as I have said, so we are constantly adjusting them like a carpenter would. So the text should bring up not just a mental or emotional response, but also a practical one. So here, in the, on the seat level, we define uh, the application. One of the basic assumptions in my book is that a text can have only one intended meaning, the authorial intent. So it is single and it is determined by the author of the text. However, meaning is not the same as application. Application is the significance of the text for a modern audience. So while a text can have only one meaning, it can have multiple applications. So in African oral literature, this distinction between meaning and significance is related to the authority one has earned during, the, during their career because the community has learned to trust them as somebody who performs oral literature. So this is narrative authority. One implication of narr narrative authority is that listeners cannot impose their own assumptions on a story or make it mean whatever they want it to mean in a postmodernist kind of way. And this is the same uh, with the biblical text. So how should we approach this final task? Meaning is communicated in a specific cultural form. Application requires that we separate the original meaning, the message from the cultural form, so that we can understand what it signifies in our modern African context. For this, we also need to distinguish between transcontextual and culture-bound truths. And so what we are doing here is actually contextualizing the biblical message. So to bridge this gap between the biblical world and the modern world, the interpreter must have a grasp of both. We also need to avoid syncretism in this process of application. The hermeneutical processes engaged in above, those legs that I have described, make this possible. So to sum up, as we go about the task of application, we must be careful not to treat transcontextual truths as relative or make culture-bound truths applicable to all. This application should be expressed in terms that we understand in African society. In conclusion, African hermeneutics, as explained in my book, begins with the assumption that our worldviews and cultures can be used as bridges to help us understand, internalize, and apply biblical truths. This is the model that was used by Jesus in his parables and by Paul in his Areopagus speech in Acts. There's not enough time to go into how this model is applied in the other chapters of the book to specific genres. However, I hope that this brief explanation has given you a glimpse into the value of using contextual models of hermeneutics to fit particular audiences. Finally, as I wrote in my foreword, Recent reports indicate that most Christians today live in sub-Saharan Africa. This means that the church of the future will be defined within the scope of African Christianity. If Christianity is to maintain its integrity as defined by biblical revelation, it is imperative that we, Africans, endeavor to understand and apply the Bible accurately as the authors of the biblical text intended. It is hoped that this book will contribute 